Go west, young man. Years after that famous statement, more and more deer hunters are taking that advice in search of monster mule deer. You know, if you've never done it, you need to try this. You need to get out and point your truck west. Hey, they may look similar, but the way you hunt them is like apples and oranges. I'm Steve Bartello. I'm Gordy Cron. I'm Mark Kaiser. I'm Dan Schmidt, and this is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. If you're up to the challenge, heading west to hunt mule deer can be an unforgettable experience. Mule deer on a whitetail hunting show? What are we thinking? Well, I'm gonna tell you what we're thinking. Mule deer and whitetail, they're basically the same deer. Black tails on the west coast, white tails on the east coast, they met in the middle, they had little mule deer babies. And today, that species has set up a home territory in the Great Plains all the way, almost to the Pacific coast. There are a number of tactics for locating muleys, but the most popular is spot and stalk. This is not sitting in tree stands for hours on end, hoping a deer is going to walk into bow range. Spot and stalk requires not only being in shape, but it also requires a different way of approaching how you're hunting. It's looking out vast areas, hundreds of yards, even miles, and trying to spot a deer that might be sitting out there, might be bedding out there. Completely different ball game. When you talk about sought after species in North America, mule deer is right at the top. The reason, the hunt, the country, and those giant antlers. You know, the allure of hunting mule deer out west, yeah, we talk about the terrain and how cool it is to find a different environment, but it's about the adventure. It's about hunting deer on their terms, not on our terms, and it's about going after them, using all your woodsmanship, your cunning ability to spot and stalk them, and getting close for a shot. I have a binocular and a Nikon spotting scope that's my duo to start any mule deer hunt, and I look for a high vantage point. Once I spot some mule deer with my binocular, then I switch to the spotting scope. And the reason I do that is I want to see whether or not it's worth the calories and the boot leather to get closer to those deer if a buck is in the group that's a candidate for my trophy room. You know, like a lot of Midwestern hunters, I grew up hunting in tree stands, hunting out of ground blinds. Hunting west is a whole different experience, and that's what I love about it. It's more aggressive. Instead of standing and waiting for something to happen, you're out there making it happen. Once I find a buck or a group of deer that I want to focus on, then I begin to think whitetail. I like to set up an ambush point. Those are whitetail strategies. So if you're coming from whitetail country into mule deer country, don't think you're coming into a whole new world. Just use a little bit of ingenuity. Use a little broader view and then combine everything you've ever done, whitetail hunting, so you can focus on mule deer success. I had never hunted mule deer before until just recently. I went out a few years ago to central Montana and boy, I'm glad I did that. The scenery is just incredible, but what's even more impressive, the number of deer that you see. There's canyons with literally hundreds of mule deer in them. The weather turns nasty right away. We're kind of coming up on a hill. We know there's a couple good bucks in there. We crest the hill and man, the first one took my breath away. And that's a neat thing about mule deer is even when they see you, you know, they, not like a whitetail. A lot of times a whitetail sees you and boom, he's gone. You know, you're not gonna see him again. Mule deer, a lot of times, and what happened here, is he saw us, hops a little ways, stops, looks back at us, gives us a great view, and actually gave us a chance to get in position for a shot. Deer and Deer Hunting Television is brought to you by Matthews Archery. Catch us if you can. Carbon Express, shoot better with Carbon Express. 
Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology. Apply, dry it, and go hunt. By the Muck Pursuit Shadow, the lightest weight hunting boot on the market. And by Nikon, the next generation of hunting optics. You know, a whitetail, when it's spooked, might head to the next woodlot. A mule deer, he might head for the next zip code. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Okay, so we're talking mule deer. You know, you go out to a lot of these western states and they have both. They have whitetails and mule deer, and you get a tag that you can hunt either or on the same tag. That's pretty cool. One thing you need to realize though is when you get out there, although there might be whitetails and mule deer on the same property, these species normally live segregated. Whitetails on one side of the canyon, mule deer on the other side of the canyon. It's pretty remarkable. You could be in an area where you see 30, 40, 50 whitetails. You go up over the next hill, it's all mule deer. I went out to central Montana. Blew my mind. I mean, not only the scenery, but how you hunt these animals and the number of animals that you see. You crest the hill and man, the first one took my breath away. He saw us, hops a little ways, stops, looks back at us, gives us a great view, and actually gave us a chance to get in position for a shot. But we get up over this hill, and there he's standing. Big five and a half year old mealy buck. I could not pass this deer up. Another point I made earlier is a lot of times when mule deer are spooked, they'll run a little bit and they'll stop and they'll look back. Thankfully for me, that's what happened here. This buck was on the move. He was gonna get up over the hill with a bunch of other deer, but he stopped and looked back, gave me the opportunity for a shot, and I made it. Yes! yes Good yes, shot! Yes! Yes! Oh my gosh! You're using uh, that. This is a beautiful gun. And you just hammered a beautiful buck. Oh my gosh, Chad. You know, th this is the thing. You know, it happens so fast. <laughs> that was a long shot. That was. You were shooting over 300 yards. And I saw this deer, uh -huh. and he was going to leave. And, and we had went around here. We checked everything out, knew there was nothing on the back. And wow, what an incredible deer. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh. It all comes together when you're walking up on that deer and he's a big deer. It just makes you so appreciative and so feeling so blessed to be able to come out here and experience this. Good. Next opportunity to hunt mule deer came in Northeast Oregon last year. And boy, this was amazing. It was completely different than Montana. This one was a real, true rugged hunt. Very physically demanding. We put on more than 12 miles in four days. 12 miles on shoe leather. And I tell you what, we were hurting, but it sure felt good. So with the opportunity to hunt with David Morris of Northeast Big Game, and it was absolutely incredible. The terrain, nothing like you've ever seen. I'm talking rugged, I'm talking rocks and hills, and rocks and more rocks and hills, and really, really demanding. So you get out there and you think, well, if I walk far enough, I'm gonna eventually shoot a deer, right? It's, it's not that easy, if you walk far enough, and long enough and use your glass, you're gonna see deer. But getting in position for a shot, it's a completely different story. And even then, by the time you get in position for a shot, you're out of breath. It's really, really difficult. It's hard to concentrate. It's hard to get a good beat on them. The other thing that I had to prepare for was a long range shot. And coming from the Midwest, long range is not 200 yards or even 250 yards like here it is at home. It's 400 yards, maybe more. That's what you have to practice for. And we practice for that because I was told, if you get a 200 yard shot, that's gonna be like getting a 15 yard shot at home. It might happen, it's probably not going to happen. You have to be prepared for 300 yards or farther. And that's what we did. So we finally get in position. The deer's out there, but he is a long ways out there. Thankfully, he's bedded. So to get in position, we had to crawl to get to a spot where I could set up for a shot. Everything had to be synchronized. I get into position, try to calm myself down. For me, that's not easy. But the key for me was getting that rifle in a rock solid position so I could go through the procedure, take the breath, put them in the scope, and squeeze the trigger. 
got him! I got him! I got him! <laughs> I did it! Oh, it was, oh my god! I mean, every emotion was just surging through my body. I was so excited. I see white belly. <laughs> Can you believe this? Not only to see that deer crumple at the shot, but realize I got it done. I mean, all this work paid off. All the hiking, all the pre-planning for the hunt, it all came right into play. I tell you what, I got the bug. If you get the chance, go mule deer hunting. You will not be disappointed. Up next. When you go hunting all west, you better be prepared because you might see spring, summer, fall, and winter all in one day. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. This is it, this could be one of the hardest hunts in America. Public land hunting. We're in Wyoming, near my home, not too far, and we're trying to shoot mule deer buck. This could be tough. A lot of people are hunting this country. I'm up against everyone else, including you. Now, public land hunting is no pushover, and that's what I found on this hunt. I was up against a lot of hunting pressure. The area was not that big. People could basically walk across it if they had the lung power to do it. But I had worked out an angle where I could get backdoor access where a lot of others couldn't. And because of that, I put myself up in the far, farthest reaches of this property. And every other hunter that came in kind of bumped deer my way. So I always ended up with a lot of deer where I was. Well, that's until the snow came. And I mean a blizzard, a torrent of snow. I wasn't even sure if I should go hunting that morning. Luckily, the snow wasn't that deep yet. Took some bearings, headed toward the public land, right to the heart of it, got into it, and immediately started seeing deer. The snow has let up some, the wind is still howling, but we spotted a buck down here in this draw. Looks like a decent four by four. He might have brow tines. We've got a group of five deer. We gotta maneuver around to get to him. Now this buck was in a great spot where I could either come around a corner and get a shot or come over the top. I made a fast move around the hill to drop in right on top of this buck. I come up over the top and there he was, right in front of me. I got down, did the old Kaiser crawl through the snow, and when I come up again, he was gone. Public lands, they get a bad rap. Some of it's deserved, while others, not so much. One thing to remember, bigger isn't always better. Sometimes the smaller parcels get overlooked. So look into every piece of public land in your neighborhood. Next, try to find a backdoor entrance. All the hunters are going to park right at that main trailhead off the county road or highway and hike in. See if you can't find another slightly less used trailhead or a section line or even talk to a landowner that adjoins. See if he'll let you cross into the back and you might find yourself all alone. Another thing is you need to go as far away from the main parking area as possible. My rule of thumb is one mile is good, two miles is better, and three miles is best. If you can get at least a mile or two away from any access point, again, you're probably gonna find yourself alone. And finally, know the boundary. If there's private land adjoining the public land, it could mean those deer are going back and forth to feed on private land, or maybe water, or find some other thing they're not finding on the public land. Know the boundaries, use your GPS. I always trust my GPS and I've even got a special card in there, huntinggpsmaps.com, that points out exactly, and I mean exactly, where the private and public meet. Public land, it does get a bad rap, but I found some of my best hunting there and I've had some of my best memories right in the middle of it. 
So it's the last day of my hunt. It was warm, the snow disappeared. What I discovered though, was that the mule deer had moved over towards some private land, actually closer to the public access, and they had grouped up into one big mass, one herd. In the middle of that herd was the buck I wanted. I had spied him from a distance. He had picked a great spot to hang out, a big broad basin. And as I mentally mapped out a strategy to get to him, all I could come up with was, I gotta do the Kaiser crawl. And not a crawl of 20 or 30 or 40 yards, which is pretty common on many of my hunts. It was going to take several hundred yards of belly crawling to get up on that buck. So I put my gun out in front of me and I started hands and knees crawling on my belly most of the time in sagebrush that barely hid my flat form. And I pushed that rifle out in front of me not only for safety factor, for firearm safety, but to make sure any late fall rattlesnakes weren't gonna buzz me right in the face. But finally I got into a comfortable spot where I felt I was elevated just above the deer and had a good perch to overshoot the entire basin. I set my gun up on the bipods and lo and behold, this buck jumps up. You know why? There's a road grader going by. First a couple does popped up and started bounding towards the buck. Then he stood up and looked back. I did not hesitate a second. Yeah. Can you believe that? I don't know how many hundred yards I just crawled. And just out of nowhere, there's a road grader coming and all those deer get up and run towards me. Wow, look at that buck. This has been one long hunt on public land and it couldn't have ended any better than that. Nice older mule deer buck, heavy and super brow tine. He has got exceptional brows. It was a great ending. Oh, this has been a tough hunt. Can you believe it? Yesterday, blizzard. All out white out blizzard. Today, blue sky and I'm gonna sweat getting him out. It was quite a treat and I couldn't have been more happier. Even though he wasn't the 30 pointer of your dreams or that 30 inch Boone and Crockett monster, he was still a respectable, mature buck and he had skipped by a lot of other public land hunters to land in my trophy collection. Coming up next, perfecting your setup in growing big and what you should be doing right now to get ready for the season. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Deer and Deer Hunting TV is brought to you by Mossberg. Built rugged, proudly American by Cuddyback, more deer, fewer blanks. Hunter's Safety System, saving lives is what we do. By Analogics, protect your herd with the power of science. And by Block Vault, get locked in. Perfect your setup and grow them big. Here's Steve Bartilla. The way you create a food pot that draws deer throughout the entire season is you offer them a smorgasbord of food types in that food plot location. It does not matter what plant you're talking about. It has stages where it's far more desirable and then it has valleys. Valleys when it's not desirable to deer at all. So if you can offer them cereal rye, clover, oats, brassicas, grain crops all in the same location. You know what? Throughout the entire season, the deer are coming there. So how do you pull that off? A great way to accomplish this, three part cereal rye, one part oats. The cereal rye is a great late season attraction. The oats are a good early season attraction. Ring the outer portion of your food plot in clover, about a five yard wide, five to 10 yard wide swath. Then plant some grains in there as well. Now let's take it a step further. Let's put some apple trees in that plot. Let's go ahead and put a little pond 
a little water hole in there as well. When you have all these things in one location, you have much more stable deer patterns because they're going to the same location to feed far more often than when you have one type of plot here, one type of plot there, and one type of plot over there. Deer Talk is brought to you by the Barnett BC Raptor Reverse Crossbow. See what's causing the uproar. I don't care if you're hunting with a rifle, a bow, crossbow, even a slingshot. This right here is one of the most important pieces of gear you can carry, especially if you're hunting out west. In some respects, we humans are pathetic predators. I mean, our sense of smell sucks, our hearing is average at best, and we can't even run very fast. It's our eyes that we rely on most, and good optics make them just that much better. Effectively hunting big sky country requires good optics, pure and simple. By letting your eyes do the lion's share of the walking, you can conserve precious energy by saving your stocking efforts for when it counts. But even the best equipment can take you only so far. After that, it basically comes down to technique. An effective glassing often sets the tone for a successful hunt. Glassing in open terrain requires a partnership between hunter and guide. You know, I might have a good eye for spotting deer at a distance, but lack the experience to field judge them from a half mile away. So here's what I'm talking about, bear with me. See that lone pine up on the ridge? Drop down about 100 yards to that rock outcropping. Is that a decent buck? You mean that little fork horn? I can break out the spotting scope. Never mind. See, that's what I'm talking about. When you're hunting big sky country, it's important to let your optics do the walking. Save your energy for sneaking in close once you've hit pay dirt and spotted that big buck you were looking for. Be sure to check deer and deer hunting out online and on Facebook.